Our next unit of study in geometry is going to be reasoning and proof. And for this, we're going to begin with patterns and inductive reasoning. Now, what exactly is meant by inductive reasoning? For this, we're going to have some new terminology, so be ready to copy these down. Starters, inductive reasoning is simply reasoning based on patterns that you observe. So if it's something that you notice and start to see a trend, and are able to make predictions of the future based on that trend accurately, then you used inductive reasoning. Now with inductive reasoning we also have a couple other items such as conjecture. This is a conclusion that you reach using inductive reasoning. So if you see somebody driving too fast and you see a police officer go past you in that same direction, conjecture might be that that person is going to be getting a speeding ticket. It was a conclusion reached using from observation of a pattern. Now one other term that we're going to have in this lesson is counterexample and this is an example that shows a conjecture is not true. And We're going to be spending a little bit of time with counterexamples so we'll come back to that but if you go by and that police officer ended up not giving the person a speeding ticket then that would be a counterexample to what you had concluded. Now as we go through and work with our patterns and inductive reasoning. We're going to be spending time looking at numerical and geometric patterns as part of this. So let's begin looking at some of these and seeing what we can find, what conjecture we can reach. So find a pattern for the numerical or geometric patterns shown. In our first series here, sequence of numbers, we have 10, 20, 4. Now, can you see a pattern developed here? Is there a way that we move from one item to the next in the sequence of numbers? And would we be able to use that to make predictions about the future? Well, to move from 20 to 4, uh, sorry, 100 to 20, we can either subtract 80 or we can divide by 5. To move from 20 to 4, we are subtracting 16 or dividing by 5. So looking for something that is common, both of them divide by 5, we can use this as a prediction basis for the future. So what is 20, uh, 4 divided by 5? Well that is 4 fifths. That divided by 5 would be 4 twenty fifths. And we'd be able to continue on because we made a conjecture based on the pattern that we saw. Now for the geometric figures, we have a triangle inside of a circle inside of a square. Then we have a square inside of a circle inside of a pentagon. A pentagon inside of a circle inside of a hexagon. This is a pattern that was developed actually to help find the area of a circle originally. What's happening each time? Well the item inside of the circle gets one more side and the item outside gets one more side. So our next item in the pattern would be we'd take a circle, we'd put the hexagon inside, and we would put a heptagon outside, which heptagons are a bit tricky to draw. And what happened was the mathematicians, when finding the area of a circle, were able to calculate the areas of these polygons and they knew that the circle had to be in between. So they looked for a pattern and they developed the formula, the exact ratio, for how to get the area of the circle from that. And that's where pi was developed from. So conjectures, uh, conjectures and inductive reasoning have been used for a long time in mathematics. Now with this, we can also we also need to look at a few other items with our patterns and inductive reasoning. What is the least number of triangles that can be made inside of a polygon with n sides? Well, to do this, we're going to need to start with some polygons. So let's take a three-sided, that's the smallest polygon, a four-sided, a five-sided, and a six-sided. See if we can develop a pattern from these as to the number of triangles. Well, the first one contains one triangle, it is itself. The second one, the least number of triangles I can make here is simply draw a diagonal, giving me two. 
third one, my pentagon, I can cut off the top and then treat what's left like a rectangle or a square and that leaves me with three. The hexagon, I can cut off top and bottom and then do a diagonal and that gives me four. Is there a pattern between the number of sides of the polygon and the number of triangles that can be formed? And the answer is yes. We take the number of sides and we subtract two. Six minus four is two, five minus, sorry, six minus two is four, five minus two is three, four minus two is two, three minus two is one. So now if I told you I had a hundred sided polygon, would you be able to make a conjecture about how many, the least number of triangles that could be formed from it? And yes, you go 100 minus 2, which gives you 98. Now, some patterns, when we look at them, look obvious, but we need to make sure that when we make our conjectures, we have enough information to base it off of. So, with the pattern 1, negative 1, one might say that this is simply subtracting 2, so I'd go negative 3, negative 5, negative 7, and so on. But somebody else might say, well, it's just multiplying by negative 1. So we could have this or 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. By simply having two numbers, we don't have enough information to be able to make a valid conjecture. So do not jump to conclusions in mathematics, especially in geometry, unless there is ample evidence to support your conjecture. Same thing with the second pattern here, 2 and then 4. Are we going to go 6, 8, 10, simply adding 2 each time? Or are we going 8, 16, 32, multiplying by 2 each time? Each one is valid. We, cannot, we do not have enough information in order to base a substantial conjecture on. Another example might be that if you were to look at backpack sales from a specific company over the course of a year, you'd see that in, from January to February to March, perhaps the number of backpack sales went down by a steady amount each time. Would you be able to conclude that it will always be dropping by that? And if you know shopping patterns, the answer would be no, because in August or September, the backpack sales would increase as students get ready for school and people are buying the product. So ski resorts, low business in, and business declining in February and March. So it's always going to decline. No, once December rolls around, there's snow on the ground, it will be brought back up. So when we are looking at conjectures and patterns in inductive reasoning, we always have to be aware of this counter. Now remember, counterexample is just one item that disproves it. If you're trying to prove something to be true, it has to always be true. If you're trying to prove it false, you only need to find one counterexample. For instance, let's take a look at these. A statement could be made if you have a reference book, then it is a dictionary. Is this the only type of reference or research book available? No, it could be a periodic journal. It could be an encyclopedia. could be any number of items. So finding one exception makes this statement not true. It's a counterexample to the conjecture. Let's take a look at a more mathematical one. So if you square the value of a number, then the number increases. And that makes sense. If I take 2 and square it, I get 4. If I take a negative 7 and square it, I get a positive 49. So this looks like it would hold true, but what happens if I take one half and square it? Well, I end up with one quarter, which is not larger than one half. So one half becomes a counterexample to what we are working with. When working in mathematics and proving stuff to be true, it must always be true. Trick with geometry and doing proofs and reasoning is taking into consideration all those counterexamples that might exist and working around them. So reasoning and proof, patterns and inductive reasoning to begin with are going to be very important as we move through this unit. So make sure you have these concepts down and are ready for the next stuff.